Is the stock market going to crash, resulting in a calamity, and AI labor market risks, and AI benefits? Hi, it's Edward, back with another video. Please take a moment to click the thumbs up button below and consider subscribing to the channel. Please also share this video with your friends. Thank you for your support. Today, I read several financial news articles. I've included links to the articles in the description below. I encourage you to read the articles to support the authors and news sources. As a private American citizen, I'd like to report and share my transformative thoughts through commentary regarding small sections of these articles that are of public interest. Is the stock market going to crash? Should you stay invested? Some of these questions may be answered by the articles that I am going to share with you. Today, I read an article on Yahoo Finance put out by Business Insider and written by Theron Muhammad titled, Bond King Bill Gross warns investors to be cautious as markets are looking dangerous. The author referenced an investment outlook document put out by the company that Bill Gross founded called PIMCO, which was titled, Fundamentally Speaking. According to Bill Gross, a century ago, a company's stock price was largely determined by hard numbers such as its book value or cash flows. Today, other factors such as Federal Reserve policies, levels of bank leverage, and momentum play an increased role as valuation drivers. Asset prices could ultimately suffer as a result as negative forces such as spiraling public and private debts and soaring health care costs weigh on government budgets and sap market support. Still, investors need at least to get on the dance floor instead of being a disgruntled wallflower, or they risk missing out on gains before the next market calamity. Well, my friends, I thought it was interesting that he mentioned the next market calamity. No one knows for sure if and when that will happen. We haven't seen a stock market crash or a calamity, as he puts it, in a long time. A terrible market calamity happened in 1931, when the S&P 500 dropped 43.8%. Another one for the history books happened in 2008 when the S&P 500 dropped 36.6%. 1937 was a bad year when the S&P 500 dropped 35.3%. In 1974, the S&P 500 dropped 25.9%. There have been several market calamities, but these were some of the biggest drops in the S&P 500. I'm really surprised that Bill Gross said investors need to at least get on the dance floor so they don't miss out on gains. Since Bill Gross is a bond guy, I'm surprised he wasn't pushing people to buy bonds. Bill Gross advised investors to take part in the market, but stay away from the riskiest assets. He said, I'm being careful and you should too, no matter how great Nvidia looks. I'm really surprised that he called out Nvidia specifically. I have to wonder why he didn't speak about other artificial intelligence stocks as a whole. Many rose last year because of all the hype surrounding artificial intelligence. Investor enthusiasm was very strong last year when it came to anything relating to artificial intelligence. There was certainly a lot of exuberance relating to AI. At times, it reminded me of the dot-com mania back in the late 1990s. Back then, any new shiny dot-com stock would soar after its IPO. People were quick to jump on the train and speculate with these dot-com stocks. Many made a lot of profit on paper until the music stopped and the dot-com bubble burst. Some strong companies survived that carnage, and many are still with us today. People at that time got overly excited about the prospects of the internet and any company that was a new dot-com. In a way, I feel we are seeing some of that with companies that have any type of affiliation with artificial intelligence. I'm not drawing parallels between stock valuations today and back then. I'm just talking about the hype in the AI space. Understand AI is going to really impact our labor market in the future, in my opinion. Some companies will find ways to reduce human capital and increase profits by replacing human jobs with AI. There is no doubt in my mind that this will happen. I also think that AI will transform many industries and a lot of blue collar jobs and white collar jobs will be eliminated. At the same time, I am sure new jobs will be created. There will be a variety of support services needed for AI. The question is, how quickly will we start seeing massive AI adoption at a lot of big companies moving forward? Some big organizations are very slow to change. On the topic of artificial intelligence, I read another article today that sheds some light on what people think about risks to jobs because of AI. 
This article was on foxbusiness.com, written by Aislinn Murphy, entitled, Study Finds 75% of U.S. Adults Expect Job Pool to Shrink Due to AI. The author of this article referenced a Bentley Gallup Business and Society study that found the share of American adults predicting AI will reduce the total number of jobs in the U.S. in the next decade came in at 75%. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. People in our country believe AI is going to reduce the total number of jobs available. Perhaps they are right. Some companies may not want to deal with advertising new jobs, interviewing candidates, going through the hiring process, going through the onboarding process, and then ending up with a person who shows up to work late and doesn't complete his or her work with accuracy. If the company can instead use artificial intelligence to do the same job and that system can work 24-7, that may be a no-brainer. The company doesn't have to worry about someone job hopping to a higher paying company after just six months. The company doesn't have to worry about someone causing drama in the workplace. I can see a lot of benefits for AI at companies. In my opinion, the cost savings will likely be huge as well. The author of the article went on to share additional findings from the study. 6% of people thought the technology would boost jobs in America. Well, I think new jobs will certainly be created, but I think we will likely experience more job losses due to AI than we will see new jobs created. Here's what I found most interesting. The author said 19% of respondents indicated they think AI will have no impact on the total number of jobs in a 10-year time frame. I personally think they are way off. But what do I know? I'm just some guy on YouTube. What do you think? Share your thoughts in the comment section below. If you work for a company that has gotten on the AI train recently, tell me if your company has replaced any human jobs with AI yet. You might be interested to know what the CEO of the Superbank, JP Morgan Chase, thinks about AI. I read an article on foxbusiness.com written by Kayla Bailey titled, Jamie Dimon weighs in on AI, says only God knows what the tech will do for humanity. According to the author, Jamie Dimon predicts AI will have a tremendous impact on healthcare and finance. He said, it is crucial to have it. He went on to say, it's going to change a tremendous amount of stuff in healthcare alone. It may come up with new compounds. It could do a better job diagnosing diseases, preventing diseases. Well, there you go, my friends. Jamie Dimon provides some examples of how AI will potentially benefit humanity. In my opinion, I believe AI will benefit humanity in a lot of ways. I simply worry about the impact it will likely have on the labor market in the long run. While some businesses are excited about the prospects of artificial intelligence, there are other companies that are trying their best to prevent criminals from stealing socks and underwear. I read an article today on foxbusiness.com written by Kyle Morris titled, California Retail Stores Lock Up Underwear as Newsom vows crack down on rampant retail crime surge. According to the author, some Target and Walmart stores in the San Francisco Bay Area have locked up underwear and socks, frustrating customers who have to wait for assistance to receive their desired undergarments. The author referenced a shopper named Olga Leon who said, It comes to the point of how ghetto does it look that they have to lock up the socks or whatever it is that they have under the key. Apparently, a customer had to wait 10 minutes for an associate at one store to open up the case so he could buy boxers. Well, folks, I haven't seen this at the Walmart stores that I have visited recently. The last time I shopped for socks and underwear at Walmart, I was frustrated that the shelves were not organized. There were socks and underwear packages stuffed on the shelves. Nothing was organized. I had to hunt through multiple packages to try to find what I was looking for. I almost got the impression they didn't have enough employees to keep some of these sections of the store well organized. I guess things are uniquely different in the San Francisco Bay Area where these types of items are being locked up. Perhaps this will be coming to a neighborhood Walmart or Target store near you in the future. The author of this article said Walmart is another major retailer that has been a target point for several organized theft rings in recent years. I just have to wonder, what do organized theft rings do with the socks and underwear that they steal? Are they selling these items on eBay? Are they selling these items at some type of mafia-run retail store in some city? When you watch some Hollywood movies, you often see criminals stealing cars and then they take them to some chop shop. 
What do they do with socks and underwear? Can you imagine a bunch of mafia guys sitting around some conference table talking about their financial interests in the cement industry, in bars, in the garbage industry, and now socks and underwear? I just think this is pretty crazy. What is our world coming to? I read another interesting article today on foxbusiness.com written by Taylor Penley titled, Mom Calls Out Bullies, Parents, in Viral TikTok After Daughter's Knockoff Stanley Cup Was Mocked at School. So this article is a bit off topic, but I thought it provided some insight into what is happening with young people in our country and how they are being influenced by brand marketing and social media influencers. According to the author, a mom called out parents in a viral TikTok earlier this week claiming she bought her daughter a name brand Stanley Cup after her peers at school mocked her for toting her under $10 Walmart knockoff. So I watched this TikTok video and the mom said she bought her daughter an insulated cup from Walmart for Christmas, which looks similar to a Stanley thermos cup. Her daughter came home from school and said nine other girls said her cup is not a Stanley and it is not cool. Her daughter was upset and asked her mom if she could have a real Stanley. The mom went and bought her daughter a 30 ounce Stanley cup so that the other kids wouldn't make fun of her and so she could fit in. She spent $35 to purchase it at a local Ace Hardware. She said she could afford it, but she didn't think her daughter needed a name brand Stanley, but she was proven wrong by the children in the school who were making fun of her daughter for not having a name brand Stanley cup. The mother said this doesn't start with the kids. This starts with the parents. She questioned what the parents are teaching their kids. In my opinion, it is not just the parents. It is often brand marketing and social media influencers, which I mentioned earlier. These are powerful forces. Now, this mom said parents should teach their kids not to make fun of other kids. I agree with that, but this is nothing new. Kids have been picked on and made fun of for years at schools for not doing something correctly to fit in. I remember when I was in elementary school, some kids didn't like my lunchbox. It wasn't some trendy kind of lunchbox like other kids had. I remember when I was a bit older in school, I didn't have guest jeans. I had some generic jeans and kids didn't think that was cool. I remember when I had a generic binder and not some fancy trapper keeper and kids thought that was weird. In first grade, I had a small box of crayons. Some of the other children made fun of me because I didn't have the big box of crayons with the sharpener built in. I always thought this kind of stuff was petty. A lot of these kids who had all of this name brand stuff in school didn't live in fancy neighborhoods. Many of them lived in cookie cutter box houses on postage stamp size lots. I always wondered why their parents wasted money on all that junk and why these kids thought they were so cool with their name brand stuff. My parents never wasted money on these things. Prior to tragedy striking my family, we lived in a big house on a hill with a lot of land, but my father was frugal and still took his lunch to work in a paper bag. He even reused that brown paper bag until it wore out. I always thought all of this name brand stuff was idiotic when I was a kid. I think this all really got bad in the 1980s. If you are my age or older, you probably remember back in the 1970s, you didn't see a lot of Mercedes or BMW vehicles. Maybe a few wealthy people in your area had one, but that was about it. In the 1970s, Mercedes made the SL, the SLC, the S-Class, and the G-Class. That was it. These were all very expensive back then. Nowadays, everyone thinks they need a Mercedes or a BMW to be cool, even people who can't afford it. Now, these manufacturers offer a variety of different vehicles at different price points so more people can afford these cars. Do any of you remember that old movie called John Q starring Denzel Washington? There was this punk kid in that movie who broke his girlfriend's arm and he said her arm got broken in a car accident. Denzel Washington asked him what kind of car he drives. He said he drives a Mercedes 500. Denzel Washington asked him what year? The punk kid said 1986. He then said, it's a classic. This kid thought he was so cool because he drove a Mercedes 500. That movie came out in 2002, so the Mercedes 500 was 16 years old at that time. I hate to break it to you, but no one thinks you're cool driving a 16-year-old Mercedes 500 with a lot of deferred maintenance because you can't afford to get it all repaired given the high cost of maintenance on those cars. 
Understand I'm not bashing the 1986 Mercedes 500. I actually really like that body style. I liked the heavy doors on those cars. It almost felt like you were closing the hatch on a submarine when you closed one of those doors. Some of these cars had automatic door closers, which were pretty cool, unless you had to pay to replace one. I know someone who had a Mercedes 560 SL, but he sold his business for $30 million and could afford to buy one new and maintain it throughout the years. I also know someone who bought a 1989 Mercedes 6.0 AMG. He went to Germany to buy it, and then he had it shipped back to the U.S. He rarely drove it. He drove a Toyota Camry day to day. Neither of these guys bought a worn out Mercedes from a tiny car lot in a less than desirable area of town for a fraction of what it cost new to look cool. These guys were successful and they could afford it. They didn't need to impress anyone. They were simply car guys and they wanted one of these vehicles. They worked hard and made a lot of money and buying these cars was like buying a candy bar for other people. Some people buy these old worn out Mercedes and BMWs for the image because they think an image is so important. When in fact, they should be buying a nice pre-owned Toyota Corolla with good gas mileage that is less expensive to repair. I simply don't understand this Stanley mania recently, and I don't understand why people are so focused on image. There are so many people who want to look rich, but they will never be rich because they are spending all of their money on an image instead of living frugally and investing their money in assets that provide a financial return. It's kind of like that movie called Romy and Michelle's High School Reunion. These were two party girls who really hadn't done much with their lives, but they wanted to impress people at their 10-year high school reunion. Romy borrowed a Jaguar from a coworker, and Michelle made outfits that they could wear so they looked fancy. They also cooked up a wild story that they were wealthy because they had invented post-it notes. These were two party girls who had spent their life worrying about what everyone else thinks, and they never amounted to much. In that movie, the unpopular guy in school ended up inventing a special kind of rubber, and he became wealthy and successful. I'm really curious if any of you knew people in high school like these two girls. I really hate it to hear about this young girl who got picked on at school because she didn't have a name brand Stanley insulated cup. How dumb is that? Kids here in America need to focus more on learning in school so they can try to keep up with how advanced children are in other countries when it comes to their level of knowledge. What do you think about this Stanley insulated cup phenomenon? Share your thoughts in the comments section below. Please keep in mind that everything in this video is for entertainment purposes only, and nothing in this video is financial advice or advice of any kind. If you need advice, seek advice from a qualified professional in good standing who puts your interests first and foremost. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to the channel. Please also consider sharing this video with your friends. I want to extend a special thanks to everyone who has subscribed to this channel. I want to also thank all of my channel members. Check out some of the great books that I suggest you consider reading in the description below. I've included Amazon affiliate links to these books. As an Amazon associate, I earn from qualifying purchases. Stay healthy and wealthy. I'll see everyone in the next video.